so what do zombies have to do with diplomacy? Well, uh, a few years ago, some, some bad guys uh, used tens of thousands of compromised or zombie computers located all over the world to launch an attack against a number of U.S. banks trying to knock them offline. Now, of course, we use technical means to try to respond, but we also use something new. We use diplomatic means. We contacted, through diplomatic channels, over 20 countries where these compromised computers were located and asked for their help. Now, asking other countries for help and trying to build a, a collective response to common threats, it's a, it's a common tool of diplomacy. And in this case, it turned out to be one of the most effective tools we had in, in mitigating the threat. Let me give you another example. Just a few months ago, the leaders of the 20 large, largest economies got together and they agreed that international law applies in cyberspace just like it does in the physical world. They also agreed that no country should steal the intellectual property of another country using cyber means to benefit their commercial sector. Now, what that means is cyberspace is not some lawless zone. It's not the wild, wild web. There are some rules that apply, and, and that makes us all safer. That agreement, too, was an example of diplomacy. Uh, I'm a cyber diplomat. And before I tell you what a bunch of diplomats have to do with, I only occasionally wear a top hat now, uh, <laughs> have to do with the World Wide Web and the global internet, I, I want to go back in time a little bit. Back in 1970, when I was a wee lad, I uh, went to a movie called Colossus the Forbin Project. Now, this is the first movie where computers took over the world. The U.S. built Colossus to control its nuclear arsenal, take the man out of the middle, have perfect deterrence. The Soviets stole the information and they built their own computer. The two computers started talking to each other and they decided to protect humankind from itself. They would abolish all civil liberties and freedoms and take over. Now, <laughs> I confess, in the fifth grade, I, I sat through that movie for three straight showings. Uh, and, uh, and back then, there really wasn't uh, what we have today. There wasn't the global internet. There wasn't the World Wide Web. There wasn't Facebook or Twitter. There wasn't malicious hackers. And, and we, we didn't have internet censorship or countries talking about cyber warfare. But uh, that even back then, some of the tensions and some of the concerns we have are still tensions that, and concerns we have today. Even before the internet existed, We've always been very hopeful about the benefits that to connected to the technologies could bring, but at the same time very fearful that it could all go terribly, terribly wrong. In any event, after my uh, Colossus watching binge, uh, I was hooked. Uh, uh, a, a few years later, I got my, my first home computer, an Atari 800. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated to an Amiga 500 later, so the Atari 800, though, had this, we stored everything on cassette tapes, which, uh, which is truly amazing. A and I really became obsessed with what technology could do. Uh, years later after that, in the 90s, I became a federal prosecutor, doing, dealing with this new fangled thing called cybercrime. And then, uh, about seven years ago, I went to the White House to do cyber policy. Now I'm at the State Department, leading a, a team of cyber diplomats. I'm still very fond of computer movies. In fact, my office is festooned with over 30 movie posters where hackers or computers are the main characters. Everything from war games to The Matrix to The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo to Sneakers and, of course, Colossus the Forbin Project. But much has changed since then. Where once people thought about these cyber and internet issues as you know, just technical issues that were the province of the technical community and the, and, uh, the geeks, now countries and others around the world recognize that these issues are core issues of our national security, core issues of human rights, core issues of economic policy, and ultimately a core issues of our foreign policy. And that makes sense because as amazing as the digital revolution has been, it's really not about the technology itself, it's about what people do with the technology. Today, the same technology that empowers us can be used by nation states and criminals and terrorists to attack us. The same technology that allows us to connect all over the world can also be used to separate and control us. And, and that's why law and policy matter, and, and that's why diplomacy matters. Uh, of course, it's only fairly recently that, that the U.S. and other governments have understood that this is really a foreign policy imperative, and I think that's due to a few things. First, uh, the Internet went from being an American invention to a, a truly global platform. And, and as all, we all became more dependent on the internet for our social and economic and political lives, 
governments took notice. And while many governments believe the internet is a way to, as uh, a real boon for their social and economic growth, other governments see the internet as a threat to their stability and to their culture. And some of those governments want to change the way the internet is run. They want to impose much greater state control. But the way the internet grew up, and frankly the way the internet has thrived, has been through a partnership, a real unique partnership between the private sector, civil society, the technical community, and governments, and not just governments alone. And second, we've come to understand that the internet and technology is not only used to promote creativity and to promote free speech, uh, but it could also be used uh, by uh, states for uh, control, as a tool for control. Certainly in a number of countries, we've seen the internet and these technologies be a platform to bring people together and to give them a voice in talking to their governments. But we've also seen repressive regimes use the technology to identify and, and, and go after dissidents. Countries like China have tried to draw and try to build a cyber wall around their internet because they are worried about content and what they think is destabilizing content. And, and even here at home, where we have strong protections for civil liberties, uh, we are debating how we can have both security and privacy together in this new online space. Far from solving some of the age-old questions around human rights and security, the internet has just taken them global. Third, we've learned as we become more dependent on the internet for everything we do, we're also more vulnerable to malicious actors who may want to steal from us or even cause worse harm. Where once computer crime was the province of uh, lone criminals or cyber pranksters, today you have transnational organized criminal groups and, and even nation states who steal our most sensitive personal and financial information. Back when I was a prosecutor, some people thought cybercrime was kind of cool. But these days, uh, with the string of cyber-enabled identity thefts and some of the recent things, like hackers hacking into hospitals and encrypting medical records and only decrypting them and only making them available if they get paid ransom, I think everyone's beginning to understand how this impacts them personally. We also fear the prospect of cyber attacks by, by governments, by criminals, and by terrorists on, on the very things that we depend on to run our day-to-day -day lives, like, like the financial system, or a recent example where hackers took down the power grid and uh, denied power to over 200,000 people in Ukraine. And, and I think everyone probably remembers the North Korean cyber attack um, uh, on Sony Pictures, which was an example of a rogue state who tried to influence freedom of expression outside their borders. Now, now for me, who loves cyber movies, I, I never thought that I'd actually see an attack that was because of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, as more uh, governments are developing military capabilities online, we worry about actions that could affect the entire and undermine the entire global uh, ecosystem, and, and actually worry that this can cause real physical conflict. These, all these trends are only increasing. Uh, this is here to stay. I often say cyber is now the new black. And we're only going to see this increase as we go forward. Uh, and they're driving us to an inflection point where we really have to uh, engage. But the challenges that we face in cyberspace are really no different than those that we've had for a long time in the physical world. There are challenges of governance and of security and of human rights. And, and those are the challenges that we've always used diplomacy to address. And right now, these issues are being debated in, uh, all over the world in, in forums and rooms and groups that many of you probably have never heard of. But decisions are being teed up that can have uh, real effects on both our, our, our freedoms and our security, both in the online and the offline world. So cyber diplomats at the State Department and a growing cadre of cyber diplomats all over the world are engaging. We are breaking down the barriers between national security and human rights and, and economic issues so that we have policies that account for all of our values and priorities. We are building like-minded coalitions of countries, but also of uh, businesses and civil society. We are promoting internet freedom and pushing back against those countries who view information itself as a threat. We are working to preserve the governance system that the internet grew up with, one that involves all the various stakeholders, including end users like all of us. We are promoting laws to fight cybercrime, and 
building capacity in the developing world so that they have the ability to deal with these online threats. We are putting countries on notice when their conduct in cyberspace is unacceptable and also building coalitions to make sure that they're accountable. And we are championing a framework of international cyber stability so countries know that there are some basic rules of the road that govern their, governs their actions in cyberspace and that we have ways to make sure when incidents occur that we can solve them and de-escalate them. In short, we're really doing what diplomats have always done. We are building bridges, we're building alliances, we're bridging gaps, we're promoting international understandings and agreements, all to make us safer. This is a big job, and, and to be frank, our journey has just started. There wasn't anything even called cyber diplomacy just a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, the stakes are very high. I was at a, one of these big cyber conferences a couple of years ago, and they had a separate youth forum. And at the end of the conference, the spokes kid for the youth forum came out, and he addressed the main conference, and he said, you know, I don't know why all you old guys keep going on about cyberspace. I mean, it's, you know, to them, cyberspace is just part of their everyday lives and existence. They, they don't see any distinction. Now, for many of us, I don't think that's true as of yet, but as we have things like the Internet of Things and connected homes and everything we do is, is linked to the web, I think it's clear that decisions we made about, make about the online world have profound implications for the physical one. Will we have a global communications platform that is open and where, uh, where information can move, or will we have a fragmented one where countries draw lines and borders around their, their individual country's cyberspace? Will we, have, uh, will we be safe and secure in our online lives, or will it be the dystopian province of uh, criminals and, and other uh, disruptors? Will we have, will cyberspace be a military free fire zone or will we work together to build international cyber stability? As a big part of the answer to all those questions and, and many others is our efforts to engage the rest of the world through diplomacy to shape the future that we want. To go back to where I started, to, to the movie Colossus, we, we don't need computers to rule the world for us all to survive, but we do need the people who use technology to empower us and not to attack us or control us. We need to have a cyberspace that is open, that is interoperable, that is reliable, and that's secure altogether, not just for us, but for everyone in the world and every place in the world so they can realize the benefits. That's my mission as a cyber diplomat. That's a mission I hope we can all share, and that's an idea that needs spreading. Thank you very much.